When Vince Pop's Drag Race first hit <laughs> logo in 2009, the audience was tiny. I can actually eat <laughs> When RuPaul's Drag Race first hit logo in 2009, the audience was tiny but fiercely loyal. Flash forward a decade and viewers of TV's hottest reality competition are just as loyal but far greater in number. But as that audience has grown, it's also changed demographically, and that initial core audience has been drowned out. In this episode of The Kiki, hosts Kevin O'Keefe and Matthew Rodriguez examine the shifting viewership of Drag Race and how that change in audience has changed the show itself. Uh, I love drag queens and it's really cool. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Matthew Rodriguez. And I'm Kevin O'Keefe. And welcome to The Kiki, where drag is never a contact sport. Today, we're here to talk about Drag Race's audience and how it's changed over the years. Yes, because it has changed drastically. When I think about Drag Race's audience, I think about this kind of like upside down pyramid, right? Seasons one through three, the smallest part are like the queer people of color who were supporting it from the beginning. Then you have probably the audience grew to queer white people in like seasons four Mostly through six. Mostly gay white men, I Mostly would say. Mostly gay white men. And then seven through AS2 was when it really started to court young white girls, Instagram, you know, fans and stuff like right. that. Kati yeah, Trixie, Alaska. Now we're at this point where it's just a general mainstream show on VH1. Right, which has a much greater potential viewer base. We don't want to come into this saying like, the show is mainstream now, so it's bad. More than any other reality show, Drag Race is a show that is part of a community and it yes. talks to its community and it's very interested in what the audience is thinking. Right, and I think that's where the, why there was such pandemonium almost about Valentina in season nine for a lot of people who started the show around season seven, she was the first Latinx queen who had a really strong shot. Because that used to be kind of dime a dozen back in the show's original days. And now Valentina is kind of a rare exception to the rule. Gay white men are talking about like, oh, I wish Drag Race would go back to how it was. They're not really talking about seasons one through three. Totally. They're talking about four through six. They're talking about Sharon Needles. They're talking about Jinx Monsoon. Um, and that's not necessarily reflective of what really going back is. I know we want to say that queer people of color and queens of color not being represented anymore is the direct fault of all these other people coming in, it's that the people coming in aren't amplifying those voices, they're drowning them out. In a funny way, the winners in those eras kind of reflect the audience that the show is chasing. You talk about one through three, um, you have Bibi, Tyra, and Raja, and it's funny because that is when the seasons felt like it was a kiki between queer people of color. As the audience grows and as you get bigger, you have four through six, where you chase these winners that really won for great storylines. You know, Sharon, started this Future of Drag storyline, and I think that is a big reason why we are where we are now, like Sharon as this like white aesthetic queen. And then five, you have like Jinx Monsoon being like the underdog. And it's funny because like in a show that used to champion queer people of color, you have this like queer white person being the underdog. Her and her big enemy was Roxy Andrews, who was a queer person of color. Roxy could have slayed seasons one, two, or three, you know, yes. and like been like a huge major force. And then as it changed, she kind of ended up as this weird joke or like foil for who was the person who was being exalted. And then six, well, I mean, Bianca just ran away with season six in a lot of ways. Yes. Season six is an aberration. I think season eight is also a bit of an aberration. Those were really heavily queens of color and the top echelons, but I see them as exceptions to their individual rules. And then when we go to seven through like AS2, you're talking about these Instagram ready queens, which, which we talked about in the race episode as being um, kind of the ones who have been able to triumph. A lot of times it's girls with a prepackaged fan base who are doing well on the show. And yes, or an easily grown fan base. Or an easily grown fan base. So it's the Violets and Alaskas and now Trixies and stuff like that. And I think that even takes us into the biggest problem is now, it's not necessarily that the show is picking people who they think will be successful or whatever. They're picking people who are guaranteed superstars. They are listening to the fans to, I would say, almost a toxic degree. Yeah. Uh, they screwed themselves in All Stars 3. They introduced a jury twist that took out really the only other possible contender in Shangela. Happened with Sasha. Over, like, Peppermint was never winning that final two. Like, she literally could have out lip synced her and it wouldn't have mattered. Right. For Season 10, I think Aquaria, unfortunately, just sort of became the only viable option at the end of all of that. And Aquaria came in with a fan base, and it was a lot of the fans of all the other queens who are like Aquaria. And that doesn't mean that Aquaria is any worse. It just means that they're gonna like people who are like Violet, who are like Sasha. Yes. And Aquaria represents that. And so it's harder 
for the show to deny crowning someone who's already super popular. Yes. What do you think it would mean for Drag Race to like do a season where it just like does not listen to the fandom and doesn't care? I honestly think it would look a lot like Drag Race season two, um, which I often hold up as the exemplar of, okay, you've got a lot of really interesting characters here. They have conflicts with each other and the different traumas they bring. That to me would be fascinating. It would almost be more like a docu-series in, mm -hmm. in that regard. One of the things that I think about with audiences, how many of the queens now are actually taking to social media to talk about how the fandom is bad. Oh my God, that happened constantly in All Stars 3. We had Bendela La Creme talk about it, I think. Milk, Shangela, Shangela And Shangela is very reticent to talk about that kind of thing. And I'll say this, I think that we can even expand this beyond just race as a factor. I think we also can think about like size. Oh, totally. So Alexis Michelle gets death threats for not going home instead of Valentina. And Valentina's fans, as the iconic quote goes, I FaceTimed you in tears because people were sending her death threats. And I don't think people would have done that if Alexa Michelle were as conventionally attractive as Valentina is. Eureka, this past season, got- I wanna fuck Alexis Michelle, I'll just put that out there. You I've have said, said that before. on this show, on you'll the, say, say it again. again. One thing I want to talk about, who would have won in different eras of the show? We think that Latrice would have had a much better shot in seasons one through three. Katya, for example, didn't win All Stars 2 because the show actually wasn't listening to the fans in that case. Same with Kim and Bob in season eight. Kim had the most social media support that season. Totally. Pearl had the most social media support in season seven. If those three seasons happen later, I'm not convinced Pearl doesn't win. It, what if you brought them backwards? Like if season seven had happened in the season two world, Kennedy could have won. Candy Ho top three. What happens if you put Aquaria in season three? I mean, she's four years old. <laughs> It's interesting to consider a queen kind of has to come at the right time. This is an, er an era that feels like it was way too much about the fandom. Yeah, and I think that that's something they're gonna be super cognizant, if they're wise. I think we're seeing more voices from fans of color who are aiming to sort of like take back this. And I think that's good. Total well, I yes, yeah. there's definitely a take back drag race. Hashtag take back drag race. And I also think, like we talked about before, the queens are tired of it too. Like the yes. queens do not like this ugly side of the fan base. I think it's about consistency. I think it's that like, if you're gonna listen to the fan base to select a winner, why not listen to the fan base when they're talking about racism, right? Yes. So it's either be consistent and listen to all points or say like, no, we're gonna construct this in a vacuum and just go forward and see what happens. We're just against selective hearing here at the Kiki. I feel like that was a really great conversation. I loved it. We hope you loved it too. And we hope you didn't take anything too personal since you're the Drag Race audience. Audience growing is not a bad thing. Audience growing is an amazing thing. Right. It's just about hearing all parts of that audience, which I think is where we are now. Post down in the comments if you have any more ideas for Kiki episodes, things you want to see us talk about. And make sure to like and subscribe so you can see all the episodes that we have to offer. Yes, and to see all the stuff that Intu has to offer as well.